Good evening. Good evening. to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. Welcome to our Wednesday night service. But do you have any prayer requests or testimonies you want to open the service with tonight? Yeah, James. I was thankful. I went to the podiatrist and had a nail that I was shopping for them. And they got their nails right full, you know, right off. They didn't just give her the food. Praise God. Here I was, right over nothing. But you never know. I don't think I, why they didn't go to their doctor. I don't know what they would have done. But I was, I was better to tell them that they spending myself on socks and things and that. Just like, see Bought me a bit. Got to go in and sit there with that. And, but, uh, you know, I just told I wish that they quit being the, the stupid Cupid at work. They were starting to be dusted. Everybody just wasn't in the mood. It's supposed to be a happy day of this happy Valentine's Day. And they just didn't have a heart. And it's like, what? It's so weird. Well, so, you gotta let it go, James. You gotta let it go. Yeah. Let it go. Shine your light, let it go. <laughs> Some people just don't want to shine it back. That's all right. You just shine it anyway, James. Yeah. Praise the Lord. No. I. Oh no, I haven't heard about that. Oh my goodness. I'd like to ask prayer for um, for for Pam. Um, I guess she'd be my stepmom. Um, she has hip replacement surgery on the 26th, and to all of her pre-surgery appointments, and has some issues with blood sugar and um, 
um, some pre-diabetic stuff. So I just pray that everything goes smoothly and that she will be pain-free after the surgery. Yeah. All right, let's stand and go to the Lord tonight. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we just ask you to have your hand upon the children and those families down in Florida. It's our hearts grieve for the loss of life and the... Jesus, we scratch our head, but we know that you can use all things for their good, Lord. That you would just touch all those families affected in the sweet time of healing as hearts are tender and turn to you, Lord. Turn this for the glory of your kingdom, Lord, that people might know you and your goodness through the whole situation, Lord. Yes, Lord, for the shooter's family, Lord. Be with them as they search for answers, Lord. Let your peace come, Lord, in that situation. Let your healing come, Lord. Jesus. Jesus. Lift up Cheryl, Lord. Healing in her body, Lord. Wisdom to know how to move forward. Lift up Pam to you tonight, Lord. For the doctor's wisdom and help her be healthy and whole. In the name of Jesus. And as we gather tonight, Lord, we cast all these burdens on your, at your feet, Lord. Burdens we were never created to carry. Worries we were never created to carry. We let them go and we place them at your feet, Lord, knowing that you have a purpose and a plan in all things. That when we choose to let go and put our hope and our trust in you, that you will work it for the good for our good in every situation, Lord. Let your word rise up in our hearts and be on our tongue, Lord. Help us to guard our mouth and the words that we speak. Let the words we speak be life and truth. And help your people to go forth to be salt and light to this world. As the darkness rages, as the, the world, the... the as the evil one the prince of this world, as he wreaks havoc, as he searches and he, he seeks whom he may devour, Lord. Give your people wisdom to see through his plots and his plans and his lies, Lord. And help us cling and stand on your truth, Lord. Let your truth be on our lips and let us answer wrath with love and peace. Let us answer angry words with peace and with grace. Let us hold our peace, the peace that passes all understanding that you've given us, Lord. Let us hold our peace and not let it be stolen or easily given away, Lord. And I ask again, Lord, renew the joy that is the strength, the joy of knowing you, the joy of serving you, the joy of being yours, of being one with you, of being free, Lord of being free for all the chains and bondages of this world, free from all the lies, free from all the self-doubt and worry, free to put our hope and our trust in you and to walk with our heads high, with hope leading and guiding us. Give your people vision, and Lord, rise up the gifts in us. Renew everyone's sense of purpose. Stir up the gifts in all of us and help us to know our place in your plan for this body, for, for the people in our lives, for all those relationships, Lord. There is nothing accidental, Lord. Everything happens according to purpose and plan. And as we gather tonight, Lord, as we lift up your name, be with us tonight as we renew our minds by the hearing of your word. And we renew our strength as we mount up like eagles on the winds of your spirit to worship and praise and leave this world behind and rise up to meet you where you are, Lord. Jesus, we thank you, Lord, that you are good, that you are so good, and that we love because you first loved us on this day where we celebrate love, earthly love, human love. Let us remember the author of love, who love is. Love has a name, and his name is Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your love, for your great love. 
that is the foundation of all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Just a reminder that if you brought a phone with you tonight to silence it or turn it off till after the service. Uh, again, just a reminder, anybody uh, interested in helping on the soundboard, Michael is uh, conducting rigorous interviews, which I think is hilarious. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Ron, you want to come take an offering for us tonight, please?
said rejoice and again I say rejoice hallelujah we rejoice in the Lord at all times thank you Jesus thank you Lord thank you Jesus hallelujah Lord thank you Lord thank you Lord we bless your name tonight Lord we love you we thank you Jesus for all of your blessings for all of your kindness for your favor for your protection and your provision for being everything to us Lord we thank you Lord for showing us what real love is what true love is and we bless you for that Lord and everyone said in Jesus name amen amen God bless you, you may be seated Thank you, Suzanne, for opening. Thanks, Mike, Suzanne, and James for leading us in worship tonight. Praise the Lord. God is good. Amen. Happy Valentine's Day to everybody. And uh, was that? James said something romantic, I think. Well, maybe not. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, I'm going to be, uh, as I always say, and I usually am going to be brief. Praise the Lord. But I, I intend to be. The longest part of this message will be the opening scriptures. Praise the Lord. Uh, not really, but <clears throat> I just had a <clears throat> once in a lifetime experience. And I won't be doing that again. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Thank the Lord. Amen. All right. Praise God. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 22. It's familiar, uh, but I never know for sure who all is going to be here. But I'm going to read this. <clears throat> uh, Genesis 22, 1 through 19. So you all know the story, but it won't hurt for us to... I'm going to go back over it again anyway. <clears throat> Genesis 22, verses 1 through 19. You know, I'm, I, I just, I know sometimes I, when I say things, I, I think later, I wonder how that was understood or interpreted, uh, because I know sometimes I'm not always that clear in the way I'm saying things. I think I, I, it sounds right in my mind, it just doesn't necessarily always come out right when it comes out of my mouth. It's a disconnect there or something. But, but I guess what I'm saying in a roundabout way and what I was trying to... Uh, first of all, I'll just say, uh, as far as Sunday goes, that's the way it is. We are Christ in this world. I mean, all, you just read the Bible. I know it sounds crazy, but the more you read this, the more you realize that's the reality. And that's what... We're, we're trying to achieve. We want to be that just, you know, we want to grow up into that full stature. We want to be, and I'm not talking about living a life where you don't ever, you know, miss the mark or, or fail because that's just, we're in a fallen world and we deal with stuff. So we're, we're not perfect except in Christ. Amen. And there we are. And uh, if, we, if the church can ever get to the place where we really begin to, comprehend this I mean on a spiritual level not just intellectually I'm telling you we'll make the book of Acts look like a kid's story I mean it, it, it can turn everything around and we're living in a world just as we was brought up to today and it, it happens almost every day and if it isn't a shooting in a school it's some other tragedy or you know, we're talking about the, uh, you know uh, child uh, abductions and and uh, abuse and all of these just horrific things that uh, are almost incomprehensible uh, to a lot of us because, I mean, it's just so unlike what we knew as kids growing up. I mean, the, the world is just like spiraling into this madness. And uh, for that to change, we have to really begin to believe God and begin to pray and take authority over some of these situations. That's the only way it's going to change. It isn't going to change by, I mean, we know you, you can't uh, legislate morality. You, you cannot 
pass enough laws to get people to do the right thing. That's just all there is to it. It's, and, and when I say that the devil is what the scripture says is he has been dethroned. He has, his power has been taken away from him. But there is in human beings unsaved, unconnected to Christ the influence of the fallen world. And we're just seeing that escalate. And I think that may be partly what the scripture says in the last days, you know, unless those days be shortened and so on and so forth. We're just seeing the escalation of this demonic influence in people's lives. The people are just people. But without direction, without, as Tim was saying, without a focus on God, they're left to the world. And it is fallen. It's just they're born into sin. That's all there is to it. And this is one of the things about even like with I talk about Sunday school. I know for me personally, and I'm a little bit off track here, but this is on my mind. But when I was a kid going to Sunday school, we didn't I didn't go. We didn't go to a church that really preached a quote unquote salvation message. But they preached Jesus. They preached God, that there was God, that he was real. And that's the thing that when my life got so out of control and so screwed up that I knew there was a God. Now, I didn't have any theology. I really didn't understand much about it, but I knew there was something greater than me. There was something I could turn to. And that's what happens in our Sunday school. Even though, you know, they may not be getting a doctrinal message every time they're there, but they're, see they're in the environment where God is real to people. That makes Him real to them, right? And it, they may or may not come to a saving uh, place in Christ right in our presence where we're here to see it and, and rejoice and, and have the excitement and the and the uh, the enjoyment of seeing that happen but it will happen because if the seed is sown it will produce at some point it will produce and they will come to Christ and that's what this is about it isn't just you know how many you know ticks we get on our you know ticket for doing the good stuff but it's, it's having that influence. And, and we have that potential every day, everywhere we go. Because you know, the world is cruel, it's, it's cold, it's hateful. And when just a smile and a praise the Lord and, you know, God bless you, is a reminder that there's something more than just this dog-eat-dog -dog kind of situation that we find ourselves in so much in the world today. So, anyway... I said that for this, you, you know, you can't really teach revelation. Now you can, you can present the word of God in a way that maybe it hasn't been necessarily seen or heard before, but it's still the word of God. So you see, you can't force revelation unto people and uh, you just teach or preach the word of God and people receive revelation. Because it's personal. You can see it in Jesus himself. He said, who do, who do men say? He was checking to see. Is anybody getting the revelation here of who I am and why I'm here and what this is all about? So he asked, who's everybody saying that I am? Well, some think you're this and some think you're that and the other. And But who, okay, how about you that have been the closest with me? Who do you say I am? So he's, he's feeling them out to see, is there any spiritual thing going on here? Are they getting revelation? And I'm not, listen, I'm not saying this to, to say like, hey, I've got it all and, you know, everybody else doesn't know what I'm talking about. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm just saying we all are in different places because it is personal. Some people have more revelation in this area and others in this area. And that's why we share the things that we do at the beginning of the service to give people an opportunity to say what's on their heart, what the Holy Spirit is saying to them, what how they feel led, and so on and so forth. That's important. So... Uh, but as I say, revelation is something that you receive. It's something that's given by God, by the Holy Spirit. So it, it, it can't necessarily, I mean, you, you, it comes by the word of God. So you teach the word of God, but you can't really teach revelation as in other words, is what I'm saying. Amen. It's just like that. You can tell people about Jesus. All, all, every one of us have been in this situation, right? But everybody, but they don't all respond, do they? Some it's weird. You know, some will just immediately embrace it. They're thankful. They're grateful. They, they're excited. Others just look at you like you're 
from another planet. They don't get anything that you're talking about. They don't want to hear anything you're talking about, right? But it's because everybody individually has to receive Jesus. It's a personal thing. You can't just throw it out there and think everybody's going to respond the same way. It's a revelation. It's the most important. God Himself, He said, first of all, they got to have a revelation of God. They've got to have a revelation that there is a God. Right? right? The beginning of wisdom is an awareness that there's God, that there is a God. So what we do is just we keep sowing the word. We just keep putting the word out there, as you do, in an individual basis, and that's how revelation ultimately comes. But we can't measure people's, you know, uh, spirituality. Let me say it that way, by revelation, but by their willingness to receive to be open to what the Spirit is saying and what the Spirit is trying to do. Amen? So it's a personal revelation Amen. from the very beginning, from the awareness that there's a God and that God manifested Himself in the person of Jesus Christ and died for your sins and was raised again. Amen? So that He is in the position of all authority and power now. And then our faith has to be in that reality. And that's how we are in Christ. We're baptized into Christ. Right? So, anyway, that's, that's the, the thing we're trying to accomplish. And it isn't like we're measuring one another that, hey, I got this, and you don't have that, or you've got this, and I don't That's not the point. The reason we come together is so we can all share. Because it's personal, God deals with us personally. Now, the Word is the same for everybody, but yet we know that we get certain things from God at certain times, even from Scripture that we've read many, many times, all of a sudden it says something else to us. It doesn't take away what he said before, but it, it's, it's like it expands. It, gets, it becomes more intense. And that's, that's what we're dealing with. And that's where the body of Christ comes together, amen, to edify one another. Amen. You know, to encourage one another and to receive from one another. Amen. I mean, every, every service, somebody's coming in here not feeling that great. Something negative's happened, something you know, pressing is on them, something, anxiety, whatever it might be. And so the way that we interact with one another, somebody else has some joy, somebody else has, you know, laugh with them that laugh, you know, weep with them that weep. That's the idea of us being together is to be able to bear one another's burdens and to be able to share things that will be a positive influence in their lives. Because, like I said, this world is against us, just as it was against the Lord. So there's, a, there's just that weight in and of itself. Just living in, on this planet, amen, can be stressful and, and, you know, weighty, if you will. And that's why our focus has to be on Christ and, and who we are in Him so that we can continue to be overcomers, amen? amen? All right, so Genesis chapter 22, beginning at verse 1. It came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. Now, He didn't really tempt him because we know God tempts no man. He's trying Abraham. He's showing Abraham to himself, not to God, but to Abraham. He's, he's bringing out Abraham's faith. He's exposing it. He's putting him in a position where he can exercise faith and know that then he can trust God. That's the reason for faith is not just so that we can say how faithful we are, but how faithful God is. So... It came to pass after these days that God tempted Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. Abraham rose up early in the morning, saddled his ass, took his two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. 
So they went both of them together. They came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh, as it is said to this day, In the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time, and said, My, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gates of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned unto his young men, and they arose up and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt in Beersheba. So we read all of that so that we can kind of understand faith can be confusing. It can be scary. It can even be unreasonable. Faith requires a leap from evidence to trust. What God asked Abraham to do is so beyond reason. It's, it's beyond evidence. It's beyond wisdom. It's beyond ethics. It's unreasonable faith. There's no morality or logic to explain this. There's nothing Abraham can really lean on to give him rationale for believing. Right? I mean, God's taking the thing, the very thing he promised him and telling him to kill it. I mean, this, this defies human understanding, quite honestly. And so, there's nothing for Abraham to kind of fall back on or to lean on or to try to find some kind of sense out of this. It's completely unreasonable. It's faith. We have dumbed faith down to, you know, a lot of things. But real faith is unreasonable. It makes no sense. There isn't, generally, there isn't a, you know, a uh, history for you to rely on personally. Right? It's just, this is crazy. How, how am I supposed to believe? Right? Look, look at this. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Well, I guess, you know, one of the things I'm saying is with all that God is saying to us in terms of who we are in Christ, imagine Jesus was operating strictly by faith all the time he was here. Yes. He had to believe who he was based on what the Word of God said to do what he did. He gave himself a sacrifice with nothing but the Word of God and His faith in that Word. And if we're going to be who He says we are, there's going to come some crap in your life that isn't going to make any sense, that's going to look like God has no, nothing to do with this, and you're going to have to believe Him in spite of it. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not, not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. See, sometimes, you know, we, we, make, we, make, we try to figure faith out. I, I'm speaking for myself, okay? If you find yourself in any of these categories, fine. But, 
you know, we want uh, we want resolution, we want answers, we want something to make sense out of it, right? And one of the one of the things that we do is try to one of the ways we deal with faith is resignation. In other words, some people will just say, well, I guess that's just what God wants. This bad stuff's happening in my life, or this thing is, you know, God just, you know, he's correcting me. He's, you know, trying to punish me. He's, he, you know, for whatever reason. So we resign ourselves to something other than what the word actually says, just because we don't want to struggle with it. It's easier just to give up and say, well, you know, I guess God's just ticked off and that's the way it is. Or God's just not going to move for me. He's just not going to do this for me. And so I'm just going to have to live with it. Or people will say, well, like this shooting, they'll say, well, that was the Lord. He, he needed angels in heaven. Or he's, you know, taking these children to, to, to be. That's just a lie. That God doesn't do that. He's not evil. He doesn't bring sickness on people. He doesn't bring disease and, and poverty and ignorance and all the things that we see in this world. God does not do that. He's trying to deliver us from that. So, by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So, true faith is ungrounded. There's nothing there for you to believe on except Him and His faithfulness. Abraham is caught between what God asked him to do and what he wants. Amen? And what makes sense and what makes absolutely no sense to him, naturally. And he's caught in the middle of this. See, and it's not, faith is not about, you know, giving away everything you've got. It's about God's call and our response. From the very beginning, the Spirit draws us, and that's how we respond. God deals with us that way forever. That's always the way He operates. So He calls, and then He waits for our response. It's about the willingness to live by genuine faith. Now, we, we in this country especially, had the luxury, even, you know, with exceptions, of course, but people even with, in the lower spectrum of uh, society, financially and everything, live as kings compared to people in some of the third world countries. Right. I mean, I've been broke in this world. I mean, I've lived off of salt pork. So you had to boil it for days to make it edible. The salt was, so, you know, there was so much salt in it. And I, you know, that was partly my own fault because of the, the choices I made. But I mean, still, I had something to eat and I could find some kind of work. I could do something, even if it was, you know, maybe didn't pay much, maybe it was minimum wage or a little bit of whatever. But you could do something to, to get by. There are people living, they just don't have nothing. They don't have anything. There's no hope for a job. There's no, uh, there's drought, there's hunger, there's starvation, there's poverty, there's sickness, there's disease, there's all these things. And so, I guess what I'm saying is, we don't need, quote unquote, faith for daily life. We do, but we don't think we do. Because we got a job, we got a paycheck, we got a house over our head, we've got clothes on our back. You know what I'm saying? So. Yeah, it's, it's when crisis arise that we really have to exercise faith. Other times we just kind of go through life thinking, well, this is good. And it is good. We're blessed. But what I'm saying, what God is saying is at some point in everybody's life, there comes a time where you just have to have unreasonable faith. Faith in what doesn't make sense but I'm going to believe God anyway. Matthew chapter 8, verses 18 through 26. I'm not trying to be heavy here tonight, but because I get calls from people and interacting with people that are discouraged, they're going through stuff, 
and they're saying, I did this, this, and this, and I'm still struggling, and somebody else is being blessed. Well, that in itself tells me that you're not living by faith. Whatever it is you're doing, you think you're buying something from God. It doesn't work that way. You exercise faith in His faithfulness. So now when Jesus saw great multitudes about Him, He gave commandment to depart unto the other side. A certain scribe came and said unto Him, Master, I will follow Thee wherever Thou goest. Jesus said unto Him, The foxes have holes, the birds, have air, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay His head. And another of His disciples said unto Him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. And Jesus said unto him, Follow me, and let the dead bury their dead. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with waves, but he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and woke him, and saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, Why are you so fearful, O ye of little faith? And then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. So he's saying, Look, I, I'm the one that said, Let's get across the ocean here, let's get across the sea. And I am with you. He said he'd never leave us or forsake us. And we're, we get into storms all the time in this life. And we act the same way a lot of times. Lord, help me. God, I, you, what are you, don't you care that I'm going to perish here? And he, he says the same thing to us. How about little faith here? Because that's how I respond. That's what I respond to. That's, that's what I'm looking for. Amen. So the problem is we're always trying to walk by sight and then call it faith. We want certainty. We want resolution. And faith is trust. Not in a certain outcome, but in a dependable God. Faith isn't just resigning to obey and, you know, do everything. And, and it's not just denying what God asks. But it's believing that God doesn't call us to suffer. Praise the Lord. Faith is inseparable from belief in God's trustworthiness and God's love. That's what real faith is. It's not faith in the situation or the circumstance or my prayers or anything else. It's my faith in His faithfulness, in His trustworthiness, and in His love. In what He has told me in His Word. Because I promise you, life, circumstances, it will all do everything to, you know, disannul what God has said. Try to get you to believe anything else. That's the only weapon the devil has. To get you to think that God won't do what God said he would do. Just exactly what he did with Adam and Eve from the very beginning. And that's what he continues to do with everybody. Get you focused on yourself and that God may not do what God said. If you aren't sure that God will do what He says, what are you going to put your faith in? You, now you're just wishing and hoping. Amen? So, look at uh, Luke chapter 17, Mike. Luke 17, verses 6 through 10. I'm glad who's here tonight is who's here tonight because this isn't a message for a new believer. <laughs> Maybe it might be a little, might be a little stiff, but we, most of us here, have lived enough life to know that it will slap you sideways six ways to Sunday, and you better have some faith. Or you'll be in a ditch somewhere, or you'll give up and be in a bar or somewhere worse. Amen? So the Lord said, if you had faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you might say unto this sycamine tree, Be thou plucked up by the roots, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. But which of you, having a servant, plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him, By and by, when he is come from the field, go and sit down to meat? And will not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself, and serve me, till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he thank that servant, because he did the things that were commanded him? I don't believe, though. So likewise, you, when you shall have done all those things which are commanded of you, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. Now, one of the things that he's talking about here is, the servant is faith. Your faith has to continually be working. 
You can't give it a day off. You can't say, hey, take a break here and uh, let, me, let me serve you. No, it's a servant to you. It's supposed to be serving you. Faith has to be consistent. It has to be ongoing. It has to be working continuously. You don't need to know how. You just need to keep it working. You need to keep it effective in your life. Amen? So, look, here's an example. Uh, Mark chapter 4, verses uh, 26 through 32. Now, he's taught how do we, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, right? So, we're still talking about the same thing. He said, so is the kingdom of God as if a man should cast seed into the ground, should sleep, rise, night and day, and the seed should spring up and grow. He doesn't know how. But he knows if he plants it, it has to produce, right? So that's faith at work. You sow the Word of God. You say what the Word of God says about your situation, about your circumstance, and you keep on doing it, amen, until you get a harvest. You don't do it for a day or two and then quit because you didn't see any results yet. You keep it working. And you keep it working by continuously confessing, meditating, and, and going to the Word of God, right? So the seed should spring up and grow. For the earth brings forth fruit of herself. First the blade, then the ear. After that, the full corn of the ear. In other words, it will, if you sow it, it will produce it. The environment doesn't really matter that much as long as you get it out there. So when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he put it in the sickle because the harvest has come. And he said, whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God or what shall we compare it? We compare it. It is like a grain of a mustard seed, which is what we talked about a moment ago, which when it is sown in the earth is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. But when it is sown, it grows up, becomes greater than all herbs, and shooteth out her branches, so that the fowls of the air may lodge in, their sh in the shadow of it. So if you just keep sowing, what little faith you've got, what word you know, and you keep sowing, and you keep sowing, that little thing can produce a huge harvest. Even though you may have little faith. Use it. Keep it working. Keep it operating. Amen. Because it has to produce at some point. It's just like a seed. This word has to reproduce after its own kind. Yes. So the problem is we, again, we get scared. See, here, Abraham's story is scary because it's confusing. He was asked to sacrifice the very thing that God had promised him. Has anybody ever had that? You've got a blessing, and it's like almost, you know, the next thing you know, it's being taken from you. It's all, and you're going, what in the world is going on here? It's hard to have faith when you believe God gave me this blessing. God gave me this favor that God gave me. And now, how can it be taken away? How can it be gone? How, can, how am I supposed to have faith? When I see it disintegrating, you know, falling apart before my very eyes. But here's the deal. Here is real faith. Real faith. To have faith, you've got to be willing to give up the promise itself. And recognize it's the promiser that this is all about and not the promise. Be faithful and the promise will take care of itself. Uh, Sally and I were talking about this the other day. And, you know, when, when I felt the call to preach, I was, I was by no means thinking that I should be a preacher. Nor did I. I mean, a part of me wanted to do this, but a part of me said, there's no way you're ever going to be able to do this. You're just not. That's not you. I mean, that's just not who you are. And you're not going to be able to do it. Well, the more I yielded to the Lord, the more I responded to the Lord, the more I thought, hey, maybe, you know, God can do anything. Why not this? So to me, then the promise was, because this is what was in my mind, make a church, you know, or at least a big church, you know, success, you know, right? Well, that was 30 years ago. At some point, I had to give up what I thought was the promise for the promise. Yeah. Yeah. And I can promise you this. God has taken care of us. And I'm not disappointed. Now, does that mean I wouldn't want to see the church grow? And all? Of course. 
But I don't get up every day living and breathing for that reality. I get up every day believing I'm being obedient to the call. That I've responded in the way God asked me to respond. And now it's up to Him. Yes. He takes care of us. Yes. So what have I got to complain about? Right. right? So sometimes that's the way it is. We get a, an idea of what the promise is and think that's the only way it can operate. And that I would ever be satisfied or could ever be content or ever feel like I've done what I'm supposed to do or fulfilled. And this happens in all of our lives in different ways. This is just my little story, right? So, but I'm just saying, I don't, I don't lay awake at nights. I don't worry about that. I just, it doesn't bother me. I'm content knowing that God will take care of me in whatever situation I find myself in. If it's a church of 10 people, 30 people, or 1,000 people. That's not how we measure. All right, so, praise the Lord. Matthew chapter 11 uh, verse 28 through 30. And in fact, God has done some greater miracles in our life in, in an environment where you wouldn't think that could happen. You would expect those miracles to happen only in a big church or in a, you know, an environment where there was, you know, all the, uh, what we think of religiously as being successful churches. But here Jesus said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Praise the Lord. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. So if you, can, if you can cast all of your burdens, all of them, hope, fear, expectation, despair, if you can unload that. See, that's this realm. That's what we're talking about. We have been talking about the last few weeks. That's this soulish realm. Just rest in the promise. God will make good on his covenant and he'll lead us where he knows we are meant to go to the place where we will be satisfied to the place where we will be fulfilled but we think we know better than God a lot of times and quite frankly I think we're just weak <laughs> of course I'm not talking to you I'm talking about other people praise the Lord <laughs> in other churches <laughs> You know what I'm saying, though? I, th I think we're just spoiled. And God is trying to get us to live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Why? Because that's the answer to everything. To all of our dysfunction. To all of our lack. To all of our need. To all of our anxieties and all of the rest of the stuff. That's the answer. Praise God. When we have faith, God proves himself faithful. Every time. Now that's not, I mean, this is not believing in God. I mean, I'm not saying that it's irrational to believe in God. But I'm saying faith itself can be irrational from a natural perspective. When you take a leap of faith, there's always anxiety. There's always emotion. There's always fear. We just trust God is going to keep the promise that he's made. Now, I've had people come to me multiple times, in fact, over the years saying, you know, hey, I'm supposed to be pastor in a church. But they never take a step of faith. Now, I'm not saying they should or shouldn't. That's between them. They know where they're at. I mean, I'm not talking about 
preaching the word. I'm talking about actually just going out and starting a church somewhere. And I, I'd, I'd hear it from over and over and over, and they never do it. That's just one example. But I've heard people tell me that they feel like God wants them to do this or God wants them to do that, but they never do it. Now, at some point, I'm not judging them. I'm going to love them whether they ever move off a dead center or whatever they do. I'm not judging them. I'm just saying, come on, at some point, you'd have to begin to think that maybe if I believe this strongly that this is what I'm to do, I would do it. That's what, I, again, I'm not trying to point the finger at me, but that's what I did. Right. And, it, and, and I worked full-time other jobs. I, we, we, I did everything. I worked for 10 years for Eagle Iron Works and pastor a church because the church couldn't pay to s support me. And when, when we took this church, it was smaller than the church. <laughs> I mean, in numbers... It was smaller than the church that I had pastored before I resigned. And God told us, that's your job. That's your only job in terms of how you're going to make a living. You make that your focus. Well, Sally agreed. I knew that was the Lord. <laughs> now, we're laughing about it. And I am laughing with you because I know it's... Uh, yeah. But it, that's... She said... I, did, I didn't say, hey, look, you're going to have to get on board with this so we can do this. No, I didn't say another word about it after the initial offer was made. I prayed to God and I just said, Lord, if this is what you really want, then you're going to have to get her on board because I'm not going to. Because I'm not going to have the, hey, I told you we shouldn't have done this, you know, 10 years down the road or whatever. So I came home on a Friday night. I've told the story many times, but I came home on a Friday night after being out on the road all week. I walked in, I never said one word about it, hadn't, hadn't even talked about it. And she said, I believe the Lord wants you to take that church. So I knew it was the Lord. The problem was, the money that came in for the church barely paid the utilities and the rent on that. If you remember that building out there, it was like a wind tunnel. There was no insulation. It just sucked in the wintertime. It just, you had to have the temperature up to like 90 degrees. And it was continued, the furnace ran all the time just to maintain a, a, you know, some kind of relative comfort. And in the summertime, it was the same thing with air conditioning, you know. And I'm not complaining, I'm just saying there wasn't any money. We were cleaning construction sites, we were doing all kinds of work on the side, even though, see, God had told me, this is your job, this is what you do. But what my idea of that was, well, praise the Lord, I'll just kick back and, you know, the money will just come rolling on in. No. He was doing with me what he did with Abraham. He was saying, okay, what part of this promise are you after? You know, are you really in with me on this thing? Are you really on board? Or are you just, you know, looking for a handout? So, but over time, God showed himself faithful to the promise if I would remain faithful to the call, to the purpose that he had given me. To the point where when we got this building, it was it's paid for. We don't have any debt. There's still bills. and we're, Believe me, we're not getting rich. But it's not like it was 20 years ago when we struggled every month to try to you know, make it and so forth and so on. So I understand this, and I think sometimes people forget that. But look, I, I couldn't get here without being there. And people want to just be there without the leap of faith, without taking the step of faith. They want it just to happen. Again, it's saying, well, I, I, I believe this is what God said. Well, if you really believe it, then do it. Right. Don't, I'm not going to judge you if you don't, but don't keep whining about it not happening if you're not going to do anything to make it happen because you have to take a step. Yes. Now, this is for all of us because it, it happens in all different ways of life, okay? So... Again, now the, a leap of faith isn't always extreme. And it doesn't always look the way we think it's going to look. Bigger isn't necessarily better. It's not about the size of the leap. 
It's about the leap itself. I hope you're hearing me. Because you, you don't... You may never be asked to give away everything you've got and go to, you know, Bora Bora or someplace to preach the gospel. But I promise you, you're being asked to take steps of faith all the time. They may be small ones, but God's not judging how big of a leap it is. He's just judging whether or not you're going to leap. It's not about the size of the leap. It's about the leap itself. In fact, it might be more accurate to say it's a leap to faith. It's all about the moment of trust, not the size of the jump. If you're standing in the dark, you're in a strange location. It's pitch black. You can't see your hand in front of your face. You don't know what kind of hazards there might be all around you. The leap of faith is simply a step forward. That's what faith is. Even an inch or two is a leap forward into faith when you don't know what the outcome is. And if you know what the outcome is, it's not faith. Proverbs chapter 3 Verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord. This is God's word. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. I believe that. It hasn't always looked like he was involved. A lot of times it looked like I would got behind the wheel and I was on the wrong road going in the wrong direction. But somehow God directed my path. See, God may want you to move an inch or he may want you to move a mile. You might find resolution in a second or you might grope around for a decade. You don't know until you leap. But I do know this. The leap is the answer. Because we are creatures of faith. God is a faith God. And we are created in His image. And if we don't operate by faith, we are dysfunctional. not only the answer it's the challenge of authentic spirituality we've defined spirituality as all kinds of things but the truth is true spirituality is faith faith in a trustworthy faithful God Abraham it says believe God and God called that righteous Praise the Lord. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. Why? Because we believe God. Because we have faith in God. That's what makes us righteous. The same thing that made Abraham righteous. Not his good works. Not his good deeds. Because he was a screw up like all of us. But he believed God. And God said that's righteous. And that's what he says about us. So faith isn't just believing whether God exists or whether God's good, but whether He's faithful. That's what faith is. Let's just close with this. Psalms uh, chapter 18, verses 1 and 2. And we'll just wrap up here with the Word of God. I will love Thee, O Lord, my strength. My strength. He's my strength. He's my shield. Amen. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, 
my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. Verse 20 through 30. Same chapter. We do well to be reading these, meditating on these, reminding ourselves. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. What's my righteousness? I believe him. He rewarded him according to his faith, according to his believing him. According to the cleanness of my hands. We know David, the writer of the psalm. His hands were not clean in the natural way of thinking things. He was not a right standing man in many things. But because he had faith in God, he was a man after God's own heart, and God called him righteous. And God said, your hands are clean. Even though to us, we'd say those are pretty dirty hands, right? Cleanness of my hands, he has recompensed me or he has blessed me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. In other words, I've trusted. I've just continued to believe God and trust God. For all his judgments were before me and I did not put away his statutes from me. His word. I kept the word. I kept believing the word. I was also upright before him. That's us. We are upright before God. We are accepted in the beloved. I've kept myself from mine iniquity. What's my iniquity? To doubt God, to question His Word. Therefore hath the Lord recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to my belief, according to my faith, according to my trusting in His trustworthiness, according to the cleanness of my hands and His eyesight. With the merciful thou wilt show thyself merciful. With an upright man thou wilt show thyself upright. And I might just say... With the faithful, he will show himself faithful. Yes. With the pure, thou wilt show thyself pure. With the forward, thou wilt show thyself forward. For thou wilt save the afflicted people, but wilt bring down the high looks. For thou wilt light my candle. The Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. Give me revelation. For by thee I have run through a troop, and by my God I have leaped over a wall. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those who trust Him. Praise the Lord. So I'm saying, for us, it's more than just getting revelation about who we are, but about manning up. And I use that non-gender specific. Amen? And be who we are. And the first step for that is to take that step into darkness if it has to if, if it's only an inch do it and God will reward it as if it was a leap of a mile he's just looking for faith because that's what he wants to reward that's what he wants to bless us with if we can if we can just trust in his goodness in spite of what we're seeing because it doesn't work the same for everybody one person bang you know they you know they're blessed in in a second and you're going wow that's awesome. And the next person is struggling for a decade, you know, 10 years, 15 years. The difference is faith, believing God. And I'm telling you, if you, have, if you put your faith in God, that 10 years can be the best 10 years of your life, even though you're groping in darkness because you're living by faith and God is directing your steps. Amen. Now, to the outsider, it may look like, well, they ain't going anywhere and I don't know why. No. No. They're succeeding because they're trusting God. They're believing God. And God is saying, that's righteous. That's my man. That's my woman. That's my child. That's what I'm looking for in this world. That I can reward. That I can use. And I believe, as in many cases, the latter shall be greater than the former. Our end days are going to be far, far greater and have a much greater impact than anything we've done up to this point. And I mean that as the church collectively, but for us individually as well. That's what I believe. That's what I was talking about when I said, you know, I prayed that my grandson, uh, his leg wouldn't be broken. Well, it was broken. So that you could resign yourself to just saying, well, it's broke. What, the, what can I do about that now? What else is there to do? Just forget about it. No. Can they set the thing? Will he ever be normal again? Will he be able to walk? Because it, it was a bad break. So we just, what do we do? We pray 
and believe that God's goodness will prevail. Yes, he may have a broken leg, but hey, lots of people had broken legs, including me. Amen? He's young. He's put a cast on. He'll be fine. God doesn't control every single little thing that happens in this world. But He will give us the outcome that we need if we will trust Him. And you can't just give it a shot and didn't get an immediate result and then just go, well, I guess, you know, just whatever happens, happens. No, He's looking for faith. Faith is what makes us righteous. It's what got us into this position in the first place. We believed. Amen. We trusted in His Word to be true. That He will save me. That He will deliver me. That He will give me eternal life. Praise the Lord. And that's true for every single thing that we go through in life. And, until the, and my feeling is this. Until the church really starts living this way, we don't have much of a testimony to a world out here that's going through all kinds of stuff. They need to see somebody who believes. That's what was different about Jesus. He believed and he was trying to impart that to these disciples and to everybody around him all the time. God is good. Trust him. Believe him. And he'll give you the victory. Even when it looks like a crucifixion. It may just be because he wants to give you a resurrection is more glorious than any death that's ever taken place. Amen. Praise the Lord. He wants to come alive in all of us. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Well, we blessed you on Valentine's Day, didn't it? Praise the Lord. Amen. God is good. I'm just saying, He loves us with an everlasting love. Let's trust Him to be faithful. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Life will be good. I promise you, even when it's bad. Praise God. God bless all of you. Have a great Valentine's Day, the rest of your day, evening. Enjoy your loved ones, or loved one, hopefully. Praise the Lord. Maybe I should say that. I forget, this is not about the kids. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you. Have a good rest of the week. Go in faith. Praise the Lord.